Good morning, Grove Church. My name's Rachel, and I want to welcome you this morning. If this is your first time with us, or maybe the first time in a while, we're so thankful that you decided to spend your Sunday morning here with us. Before I fill you in on some announcements, I want to let you know how much we value connecting with you. So inside of the program you received, you'll find a connection card. We want to encourage you to fill that out so we know how we can be praying for you, celebrating with you, and connecting with you. If it's your first time visiting with us, we also have a gift for you. So please, as you drop off your connection card on your way out, make sure to stop by the Welcome Center and grab that gift. 
Hey guys, it's Pastor Barry here, and I am with my friend Jessica Golding with Blue Marlin Real Estate. And we want to tell you about a Christmas opportunity that we have with the Grove Church in Blue Marlin. It's called Bikes for Brevard. What kid doesn't want to wake up to a bike under the Christmas tree? So with your generosity and your giving, we want to make that a reality to put as many bikes under the tree for as many kids in our community as we can. That's awesome. And Grove, here's where you step in. We have the opportunity to purchase these bikes. So we're going to be collecting funds between now and December 15th to buy as many bikes as possible uh, for this upcoming Christmas. With your generosity and your help, we're gonna see God come and show off this Christmas as kids all around the area wake up to brand new bikes. Have you ever seen those angel trees at McDonald's or maybe the Salvation Army or the YMCA where you take the angel off of the tree and buy the gift for the kid that's on the back? Well, Project Noel is a lot like that. Did you know there's 250 kids in this county alone whose parents have passed away from a drug overdose? And us as a church get to provide Christmas for those kids this season. What you're gonna do is you're gonna go out to the lobby, grab one of these envelopes from the sign, open the envelope, follow the instructions inside, have a great time gathering these gifts, bring them back to the Grove Church by December 2nd, and we're gonna make Christmas happen for over 100 of those 250 kids. Grove Church, thank you so much for your generosity. You're gonna make a huge impact on these kids' lives. Grove Church, we wanna thank you for continuing to support the work of ministry financially. Because of your generosity, we're able to reach our community, serve others, plant churches, and be the hands and feet of Jesus. We have a few safe and secure ways to give. You can give online on our website or app, or you can use the envelope in your program and drop it off on your way out. I just wanna encourage you to keep trusting God, knowing that He can do far more with our 10% than we can ever do with 100. Now let's continue in the service. The holidays are upon us, are they not? Recently shopping this past weekend, it happened. It happened. I'm walking around Target. You guys, you guys know what happens at Target, right? Like that little section in the back, sometimes it's back to school, sometimes it's patio furniture. Well, lately it's been Halloween and harvest decorations, right? But on the outside of that area, waiting and looming are the Christmas decorations. Shame on you, Target. Thanksgiving isn't even here. But Christmas is looming. Christmas is right around the corner. And just like you saw in that video, we have a beautiful opportunity for Christmas this year as a church. Now, I know the 8 o'clock service isn't quite as bold as the 9.30 or the 11 o'clock service, but what I have with me that... You have an opportunity to prove me wrong, sir. What I have is I have three children from Project Noel. Hey, let me have one. <laughs> I don't even have to finish because the Grove Church, there are more out in the lobby. You can gather as many as you'd like. The eight o'clock service is as bold as the 11 o'clock and the 9.37. Y'all did me dirty because I had this whole thing in my notes. I'm so grateful to be in this gratitude series and I'm so grateful to watch a response for a church that continually steps in the gap and meets the needs of its people in its city. Project Noel has 250 kids that have been left behind from an overdose death of their parent and we are showing up and watching God show off this Christmas season, are we not? So right out, yeah. Right out there in the lobby, you can grab another four or five more, but we're gonna meet those needs this Christmas season, but, but we can't just breeze over Thanksgiving, can we? We can't just breeze over Thanksgiving this season. Friends and family are going to get together. You probably have a, a weird, crazy uncle or a drunk brother-in-law or whatever coming over to the house. Is that just, is that just my family? <laughs> they don't get up at eight o'clock. That's fine. <laughs> 
But we're going to make a whole bunch of memories this Thanksgiving. But, but I go back to some old memories that I have of my Thanksgivings as a child. My mom would always experiment on Thanksgiving. Okay, we had the traditional turkey like most families. But, but as that went on for a few years, my mother would experiment with a different kind of fowl. You can interpret the spelling of fowl however you'd like. I remember one year we had a duck. We did Cornish hens. We did all different kinds of cookings of those birds. But as that got a little bit bored, she began the real experimentation. She did do a turducken. <laughs> the beer can inside of the, of the bird, all those different things. She did all of that. But then she would go a step further and we would try different animals from the barnyard. Possum, armadillo, squirrels, Monkeys, caterpillars, unicorns, we ate them all. <laughs> Every kind of animal you can imagine we have had for a Thanksgiving dinner. And when it was good, woo, it was good. And when it was bad, it, it, was, it was still pretty good. You eating a caterpillar or a unicorn, that's pretty good, good Thanksgiving, <laughs> Thanksgiving dinner. But those are just some different kinds of things that happen on a Thanksgiving meal, isn't it? But what I noticed over the last few years of my wife and I hosting Thanksgiving dinner at our house, pray for us, I noticed groups and tribes being formed. Have you noticed this in your own life? There's, there's these different kinds of tribes being formed, two very distinct groups of people in our home on Thanksgiving. What we have is we have Macy's Day Parade people and we have football people. See, Macy's Day Parade people can like football and football people can like the Macy's Day Parade, but you can't like them both equally. Don't lie to yourself. You see, but even in those groups of people, although they're polarized and opinionated, there are other groups of people being formed within those groups of people. There's splits as well. See, within the Macy's Day Parade group of people, there are float people giant Pikachu. <laughs> and then there's performance people. Some people desperately want to see the masterpiece of the giant Pikachu. And others want to be delighted with Carrie Underwood lip singing her favorite song in the middle of the street. It's freezing. They're not really singing, man. But football people, football people are split too. Football people have the Cowboys people, yeah. both of you. <laughs> How <could I? laughs> My man, every year is your year. <laughs> but you don't just have the Dallas Cowboys people, you also have the losers. What? Look how sad she is. <laughs> Now that, <laughs> we're all laughing at her pain right now. <laughs> but that's not the only kinds of groups of people. You have the turkey people. Come on now. And you have the sides people. Okay. The turkey people are splintered and fractured as the other groups. Do we deep fry it? Do we roast it? Do we cook it over an open fire? Do we do the infrared thing? I don't know. They're inventing new things all the time of how to cook a turkey. And the sides people, there might as well be civil war within the sides people. There's all different kinds of casseroles, mashed potatoes, sweet potatoes. You can leave them sweet potatoes alone. Real potatoes are mashed potatoes. Sorry. But then how much butter do I put on it? Do I put garlic on it? What, you know, there's all these different types of things, these polarized and opinionated ideas about who does what. And I think while we're in this gratitude series, we can point out we do that too. We completely miss the point and we completely miss the gratitude in all of it, don't we? It is called Thanksgiving after all. And I wanna look at this little section of scripture in Luke chapter 10, with two sisters and their interaction at a dinner with Jesus. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 38 says, as Jesus and his disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, 
they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister, Mary, sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? They should have added some more A's and L's. All the work. Tell her to come help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken from her. See, two polarized and very different opinions. We all have folks in our families and friend groups that operate like this. One scurrying and fretting and making sure everything is just so. Y'all know there's different forks to eat different types of food. And there's different spoons to eat different types of food. I thought that was just that little spoon, like that was for a baby. And the big spoon was for me to get peanut butter out the jar. I didn't know there was different place settings and different, different types of plates and all these things. But we have people that know that stuff and it has to be just so, especially for Thanksgiving dinner with the family over. And then there's the other type of people, completely unbothered by any of it, just wanting to watch the parade. unbothered by that mess and unbothered by that moment. And I think a lot of times I approach my gratitude in that same way. I'm often like Martha when it comes to my gratitude. I have a hard time finding it. I have a hard time seeing what I can be grateful for. And I'm looking through a lens of worry and fretting and, and, and scurrying and it makes it really, really hard. My, my gratitude oftentimes gets camouflaged into every thing else. But Mary, she isn't distracted or worried about anything at all. She just found the important thing at this dinner with Jesus. She's being deliberate with where her attention is. The first thing that I want us to see during our time this morning as we we're preparing our hearts for Thanksgiving is gratitude is intentional. Gratitude is intentional. I heard a long time ago that gratitude is an action word and I have to take action and I have to be intentional and I have to sometimes work really hard to see my gratitude. You know, over the last few weeks, we've been hearing about these gratitudes lists. Pastor Brad touched on these gratitudes lists that he exchanges back and forth with men every single morning. And he partners with them in accountability and sharing where they're at in their lives. You can tell a lot about a person uh, by what they're grateful for. This is a practice that I've been doing for a really, really long time. One friend in particular, his name is Keith. I've been exchanging gratitudes lists with him for almost six years. Every day, I am grateful for blank. Do you know why I exchange a gratitudes list with my friend Keith every single day for six years? Can I get open, honest, and transparent with my friends and family here at The Grove? because my name is Will and I'm an alcoholic. Because my name is Will and I'm an addict. See, my name is Will and I've been delivered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind, body, and spirit. That's who I am. And what I read in these books and what I've been taught, you know, what I've been taught over the last 4,059 days is that a grateful addict and a grateful alcoholic will seldom relapse. So I'm gonna stay grateful. I'm gonna stay grateful in big things. I'm gonna stay grateful in small things and all them things in between them things. I'm gonna be grateful. Sometimes they're big and prolific things. I'm grateful for the blood of Jesus. And I'm just so grateful for this church and all the people in it. Other times I'm annoyed. Other times I'm only grateful for soft toilet paper. That's it, that's all I got. That's all I got. But if I'm intentional, I can find something to be grateful for. Not being distracted by the world and what it tells me I need to be, all this busyness and hurry. What a way to describe a life, busy. God, no, oh, man, how do you describe your life as just being busy? I don't know if that really gets it for me, Grove Church. Like, like on my tombstone, William P. Davis, he was really busy. Paid all of his bills on time. 
Like it's this badge that we carry. It's like this status that we've earned. I want to present for your consideration this morning. I think that busyness is the great enemy of my gratitude. I can't find gratitude when I'm being busy. Gratitude takes a certain amount of intentionality to slow down. Gratitude takes a pause, just a beat, and just breathe for a moment and think through what you're grateful for. And if I take that just a moment kind of pause and I look for the good in some situations, if I can push past that good and I can get over into the God, we settle a lot for good rather than God, don't we? Like that's good enough. I don't know. Maybe we need to push through that good and get over into the God part of what he has for us through gratitude. Here's the thing about gratitude though, is gratitude's not always for ourselves. The second thing that I want you to write down this morning is gratitude is relational. Gratitude is relational. Not only do we intentionally step into this attitude of gratitude and it keeps our mindset good, it keeps us uh, in in a safe kind of space in a good place, but we get the opportunity to share it. You've heard that phrase, misery loves company. We all know that. We all can easily add to a mess rather than clean a mess up, right? I'm the only one that's a messy person. (laughs) My wife and I play this game. You guys play this game. I'm gonna tell on myself a little bit here. Is that okay? We got plenty of time together. (laughs) We have this tall kitchen trash can and there is a battle that goes on in our home as to who is gonna take that trash out. We pile this thing up. Sometimes taller than me, tall. That was funny. (laughs) But whoever knocks the trash over, got to take the trash out. That's the battle. And it is a standoff. You're like, I always lose this battle if I'm honest. And I end up taking the trash out but it's so much easier to add to a mess than it is to clean a mess up. So it's always easier to add to the gossip and add to the misery and add to the complaining, but we have to shift our mind and shift our perspective over into gratitude and sharing that with someone else. We all have those Eeyore people in our lives, don't we? Just another gloomy day. (laughs) It's hard, isn't it? Hey, sometimes we're those people, don't laugh. Sometimes we're those people man, I got this new car. I got this. It's, it's so amazing. It's new to me. It's got a few miles on it. Oh, insurance is probably going to go up. <sighs> you know, that kind of type of glass, always half empty type of folks. And we will encounter some of those folks as we step in to this Thanksgiving dinner with our family, no doubt. But if we share our gratitude with a person, something begins to shift. Because I know for me, over the last six years of exchanging this gratitude list with my friend Keith, something has happened a time or two. I know you're not gonna believe this fact about me, but sometimes, every now and again, I'm grumpy. (laughs) That's gonna be a lot funnier at 9, 30, and 11 because my family will be here. But every now and again, I'm in a bad mood. Every now and again, I wake up stank. Every now and again, I'm in my feelings. I feel depressed. Every now and again, I'm swimming around in my head and I feel like my sin is collapsing in on me and the whole world is going to end. Anybody else ever wake up like that? But then without fail, over the last six plus years, something has happened. I haven't had my phone on ring in over a decade. And I look at this phone with just the stankest face and I'll read that line, I am grateful for. And then I get to watch a catalog of things that are happening in the people I have in my life, in their lives. I get to hear about restoration with men's children. I get to hear big wins. I get to hear men getting their driver's license back and new job opportunities. I get to hear about their clean time. I get to hear about God's provision in their life. Sometimes they just merely share that they are grateful for toilet paper, right? (laughs) Same things that I'm grateful for in that midst. But what that does to my heart, what it does something to my soul 
deep down in there, I get reminded of what I'm grateful for. And what that does is that begins to pull me out of my mess, out of my mind and shifts my perspective because I can glean from these people. Well, well, if they're grateful for that, I'm grateful for this. I'm grateful for my truck too. I'm grateful for my house too. I'm grateful for my friends too. And I get to fire back a list and encourage them right back with these gratitudes lists. You know, I get to see the fruit that these men are bearing in their lives. Here's the thing about trees is is the fruit that trees bear, they don't eat their own fruit. See, that's meant for everyone else. So the gratitude that you're expressing is meant for everyone else to enjoy. You get to be reminded of the ways that God has met my every need with these gratitudes lists, reminding me of his goodness, even on my messiest, grumpiest, stankest, dirtiest, most unlovely and unlovable moments, I get to find gratitude. And we have these two sisters, one choosing worry and, and work, being distracted. I have to tell you, working for Jesus ain't the same as spending time with Jesus. Ow. Talking about Jesus ain't the same as talking with Jesus. That's a hard thing for us to get over into, isn't it? But we have the other sister choosing just to be with Jesus and sitting and listening. And there's a level of gratitude here that the first sister can't understand. She just can't understand this part. And she barks at Jesus and and gives Jesus a, why don't you tell her to come help me, Jesus? She cops a resentment at her sister. You have to understand stepping into this season of time, this holiday season, folks aren't going to understand this new way you're trying to live. Folks aren't going to understand this new way you're trying to live. That was a little bit better. (laughs) Your intention with the envelopes, but the unison of the new way. We'll work on it. But folks won't understand you as you're trying to live out this gratitude thing. This is foreign to most people. It's a different kind of vibe to switch that perspective. But that doesn't mean we stop sharing it. That doesn't mean that we stop pursuing Jesus. We get ready to travel to see our families this Thursday. You're gonna need some Jesus. You're gonna need some peace. You're gonna need to equip yourself with those kinds of things because you're gonna navigate some choppy waters, some tough situations, some hard conversations. Uh, if you're anything like me or you feel like you're dancing in a minefield of what to say or what not to say on Thanksgiving, all the while they're in my house. It can be a challenge, can it not? If we don't have some gratitude, if we don't have some Jesus. You know, one of the things they call Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So I need some peace coming in to Thanksgiving. We need Jesus to help us have a grateful heart. The last thing that I want us to write down with our time this morning is gratitude is essential. It's the thing we're gonna need more than anything else in these Thanksgiving day gatherings. It's not the special dessert. It's not the deep fried turkey, the oven roasted armadillo, none of that stuff. You're gonna need quite as much as you're gonna need Gratitude. It's not any of that stuff. If you're anything like me, I have a really hard time during this season of year, during this time of year. Spent a lot of my adult life from the ages of 18 to 31 in active addiction. That's me personally. And I did a lot of damage to my family. You know, it's been 11 plus years of sobriety and living in a constant pursuit of Jesus, but there's still some stuff in my family. There's still some stuff. Do you all still got stuff with your family? Like it's been so long that you're not quite sure where it started or where it ended, or maybe it is that you know exactly when it started. It's this heaviness. It's this thing that's not really said, but it's with body language, that kind of stuff in the Thanksgiving dinner atmosphere can't quite describe it, but it's heavy and it's awkward. If I could be open on and transparent 
again, I haven't spoken to my dad in almost four years. He's said some things and done some things, and I've said some things and done some things. And when we were talking, we really weren't talking, you know? You have family like that, the awkwardness of family. All the scenarios were playing out in our head. Have you ever rehearsed an argument on the way to a place? I'm talking all the way loud. And my wife's in the seat beside me like, don't say that. Or do you replay the argument that you didn't have on the way home? We all do that. I should have said, I could have. So this Thanksgiving, I have a choice. If you're like me, you have a choice. We can either focus on what we don't have. We can focus on the lack and say, I could have said, I should have said, I would have done if it was different. Or we can focus on what we do have. We can be grateful for the folks that we do have in our lives. I'm grateful that right here at the Grove Church on Thursday at five o'clock, we're gonna host a Thanksgiving dinner for the men that reside at Walkabout Recovery and their families. And then we're gonna take it a step. Yeah, you can clap your hands for that. And then we're gonna take it a step further and we're gonna have everyone that's in recovery come and eat a meal with us. I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for those kinds of conversations I'm gonna have. I'm grateful for the laughter I'm gonna have in that setting. I'm grateful for brothers from other mothers. I'm grateful for sisters from different misters. I recently heard that second one, so I had to use it. I'm grateful for all those types of things. Our chosen family we can be grateful for. My addiction and my poor choices stole Thanksgiving dinners from me for a really long time. So I'm gonna to choose to be grateful now. I am grateful for the perspective of attitude and I'm grateful for the story of two sisters, Martha and Mary, one distracted and one content. See, they both believe in Jesus, at least enough to invite him in to their home, but both have different views of who he is individually though. One thinks that he can be impressed with all that work. Let me tell you something, Grove Church, you do not impress Jesus. He's not impressed by all the work and all the scurrying and all the hustling and all the busyness that you have. But the greatest part about that is he's not intimidated by your sin either. He doesn't care about any of that. He wants your heart. And the other sister wants to take advantage of the moment and soak it all up. She doesn't miss it at all. So the question for us as we prepare our hearts and our minds to step into Thanksgiving, who is he to you? Like individually, who is he to you? I'm reminded of this story in Matthew chapter 16. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? That's the question for us all. Who is he? And maybe today in this place with our hearts being prepared for Thanksgiving, we can focus on where do we need him? Do you need him as your healer? Your provider, your peace, your strength? Do you need him there? He's my hope. And I think if we get real honest, he's everything that we're not. And for you here today, in this place, he can be all those things for you. He can be all of those things. Healer, provider, he can, he can be your strength and your hope. He can, he can be all those things. But it all rests on who Peter says that he is. He asks his disciples this question and, and Peter answers him, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And everything rests on that revelation. The fact that Jesus is who he says he is. He can be your healer and your provider and your strength and your hope. He can be all those things, but first he has to be your savior. That's it. 
can all build on that. You have to invite him into your life. You have to invite him into your heart and allow him to guide you and teach you. Like Mary sitting at his feet and just listening, soaking it all in, that's what he wants. He wants to be that for you, your teacher. And the Bible tells us that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and that God would raise him from the dead, we will be saved because we need a savior. We all have a spiritual malady facing us. This gap between a holy and just God and a broken, sinful man, a displaced soul. And only Jesus can bridge that gap. Only Jesus can fix that broken heart of yours. Only Jesus. Only Jesus can help you shift that perspective to gratitude. And perhaps... Perhaps as we step in to this season, step in to these holidays, just like Mary in the story earlier, we can find not what's important, but, but who is important. Can I pray for us? Lord, I thank you, Jesus, just for who you are. I thank you, Lord, that you're so good even when we're not. In the midst of my mess, in the midst of my sin, in the midst of my ungrateful heart, you can just be so real to us, so real to me individually. So what I ask just from the front of the house to the back of the house, everyone in between, to begin to shift our hearts in this place. Let us look through this veil of faith and this, this hope that you have for us, Lord. That you would do something remarkable, helping us find this gratitude in the big things, in the small things, everything. That you would give us those words in those tough Thanksgiving conversations. That you would allow us to have some forgiveness in these Thanksgiving conversations that we could share our gratitude and share who you are, share how our lives have changed, share about what you've done. And maybe, just maybe, some of those folks we interact with, they'll know we belong to you by how we love them and how we care for them, by the joy that we have, Lord. But that's not everyone here. There are some people that are in desperate need of a savior named Jesus. They need you, Lord. So I ask that in this place, you would make them brave. That as this band plays this last song, you would stir their heart in a radical way. That they would come to that place where they realize that they need you and it's only you. It's always been you. It's never gonna stop being you and that they would make that confession of who you are, believing in their heart and confessing with their mouth that you are their Lord and asking you into their lives. Lord, would you work that miracle in this place right here this morning? Lord, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. What a great message this Sunday. I want to encourage you, church, as we turn our TVs off, as we walk away from this, what did we really take from today's message? First and foremost, are we actually in a relationship with Jesus? Do we know him about him or do we really know him? I want to encourage you, if you haven't taken that step into a relationship with Jesus, to do that today. I want to encourage you with this scripture. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come to give you life and life to the fullest. If you want to take that step, if you want to know that you know that you know Jesus, go to this link right here. We have simple steps that you can take to step into a relationship with Jesus right now and have that life to the fullest. Have a great week, Grove Church. And again, if you haven't taken that step, do it now.